Now, I, I feel as though, uh, and uh, my initial question about the the Kanye and left has le- been left behind. I, I'm not sure to, to the degree to which uh, someone like Zizek would disagree with these interpretations, although I'm not sure if I could get him to arrive at anything that would uh, be clear enough for me to know. Right? <laughs> but, but, and if there's a, a philosopher who might might ex- exemplify this uh, uh, tendency for the work of philosophy to become just another cultural uh, entertainment. It might be Zizek, although I, I would claim that's actually the fact that people say that about him is to, you know, a compliment to him. Sure. But um, uh, what I want to do is try to uh, get to a political philo- philosophical conversation away from art now for a bit, but we're at 45 minutes. And I, I, what I'm thinking we might do is continue on if you have time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, for a bit longer. Uh, but but from this point on, it will be for people who are paying a little extra to get access to the Patreon and and they'll see the they'll see the, you know, more abstract conversation if we can manage to have one. The death of God is about the drying up of a horizon of meaning and of a whole form of human life. Where do we stand in the illusion it makes? What kind of space are we invited into? The material relations between people become social relations between things. When we look at toasters, corn, and TVs, we don't see... We still, to a large extent, live in the interregnum between between worlds, if you will, or between paradigms. Not many people in the history of the world have faced that. Diet Soap is a sublation media podcast uh let's see here got some your bio and uh so what i usually do is start with the person's bio i have you down here jensen souther is a former fulbright scholar and phd candidate in comparative literature at yale is the author of spirit disfigured which argued that the modernist novel expresses the historical crisis of the idea of a free self-determining subjectivity at the heart of modern thought and politics. Jensen, welcome to the Diet Soap Podcast. Thank you. Thanks a lot for, for having me. Bye. Yeah, I'm, I'm wanting to talk to you about Adorno today um, because I've noticed that Adorno is a strangely controversial figure. Um, he's blamed for everything. That is when he's not being ignored. Uh, he's sometimes thought of as a thinker whose work presaged um, postmodernism. He's blamed for a cultural turn and a turn away from Marx. He sought to be elitist and Eurocentric. Uh, on the right, he's blamed for everything from the invention of the Beatles to the sexual revolution to woke politics. Um, and more importantly than all of that, um, I've noticed that there's a, a tendency amongst a kind of Lacanian Hegelian movement, a leftist Lacanian movement, to uh, oppose Adorno. Um, and and I'm not quite sure if I understand what the opposition is between the Lacanian left and the Frankfurt School uh, interpretation of Hegel and psychoanalysis. And so that would be the 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 real intent uh, of this conversation is to to outline those differences. But what do you think uh, we can? How should we think of Adorno? And uh, can we sweep away these mis- misconceptions and? To, do you think that the opposition between the Lacanian left and the Frankfurt School uh, approach to psychoanalysis and Hegel and Marx um, is one that uh, is, you know, legitimate in so much as that there really is a difference of opinion, or uh, is it uh, just a matter of uh, kind of an academic turf war? What what is the distinction there? Great. Um... Yeah, I guess I would start by just emphasizing that uh, I think that the the sort of key differentiating factor um, is really that Adorno is inheriting um, the sort of classical Marxist emphasis on, um, you know, a certain notion of imminent critique, uh, a certain notion of freedom. and also a certain understanding of uh, 
the relationship between the individual and society and social institutions. Mm -hmm. um, the most important of these, I think, is that uh, that Adorno wants to show, um, just as Marx did, that the fundamental contradiction at the heart of modern life um, really revolves around uh, the ideal of, of freedom. Um, bourgeois societies, uh, you know, sort of fundamental um, orienting aim that everyone should, um, you know, everyone is entitled to lead a, a free life and the way that this is systematically undermined, um, you know, under capitalist conditions. I think that one of the key differences, I mean, I'm no expert on Lacanian Marxism by any means, mm. but I think that, uh, that whereas on the Lacanian left, there is a tendency to um, ontologize or take for granted a certain understanding of you know, contingency, a certain understanding of the unconscious. Adorno wants to understand these, um, you know, as grounded in our historical moment, as grounded in the structure of capital. And, you know, Adorno is committed to the idea of, uh, you know, an emancipated individual, of a free individual not dominated by the unconscious, not subject to, you know, um, sort of a, uh, not subject to the uh, endless um, contingency or, uh, you know, domination from without. There is some possibility of, you know, positive individual and social freedom in Adorno's account. And this goes back to, you know, to sort of get into the Hegelian angle, this goes back to the, you know, really fundamental Hegelian idea of freedom and autonomy that Hegel inherits from Kant. We can get into that, but maybe that's an opening. Yeah, that's a great opening. Um, let's just talk about Adorno for a while, because um, the way you laid it out just now, it would be hard to distinguish Adorno from uh, an American libertarian. Yeah. And in so much as, you know, the the uh, emphasis on the in individual, on, on uh, freedom. And autonomy, um, and uh, the the um, what was the other thing? The, the, well, the right to every individual to to be to be free. Um, th these are all you know kind of indisputable values in America, and I think really globally at this point, everybody would sign up for a project of freedom for, for the most part, except for some wayward leftists. You know, yes. we, we would uh, we all sign up for that. So, but the the thing to um, that strikes me the most about Adorno is that uh, well, he wrote the book Negative Dialectics. That um, he is uh, a a, theor a theorist of the negative um, and of the dialectic. Uh, that um, I you know I, I in preparation for this, I had hoped to get his book on Hegel. And have a chance to at least skim it, but it didn't arrive yet. It's going to arrive today, okay. but I did do some reading. Um, and he started his books, Negative Dialectics. I think this is a, uh, a phrase that, you know, a, a, a quote that might be useful to put forward. It says, um, Negative Dialectics is a phrase that flouts tradition. As early as Plato, dialectics meant to achieve something positive by means of negation. The thought figure of the negation of the negation later became the succinct term for how I'm, I'm adding to this, how the, something positive uh, is achieved through negation. Um, this book seeks to free dialectics from such affirmative traits without reducing its determinacy. Um, so what is Adorno's relationship to the idea of the negation of the negation or uh, to the traditional even platonic approach to dialectics wherein through negation, a positive understanding and a positive practice emerges. Yeah, great. Um, yeah, I also want to, I'll get into this, but I want to bookmark and come back to the, the point you made about Adorno, uh, Adorno's commonality with, you know, libertarianism, but because uh, that is something I'd want to contest, but we can, we can. No, I mean, obviously, we both yeah. don't uh, think that way, yeah. right? Yeah, but, yeah. but, but it, but um, I guess I skipped over the part where I asked you to say, you know, 
how is uh, Adorno's Marxism, uh, you know, at, at play in his understanding of freedom would maybe yeah. be the question that we can come back to. Yeah, yeah, good, um, good, good, good. Um, okay, but on to the, the question of determinate negation. Um, so this is a sticky issue because I think that there's room for disputing the way that Adorno, uh, the idea that Adorno ascribes to Hegel and the sort of idealist tradition, but leaving that to one side for a moment, I think that, um, what Adorno is after with his notion of a negative dialectic, uh, is something like this to give an example. Um, Adorno wants to say that, you know, if we take take the notion of individual freedom that we've been discussing, he wants to say something like, um, on the one hand, uh, the individual can only be free and can only actually be an individual um, in the context of society, in the context of institutions, um, which grant one the right to, um, you know, uh, freedom, happiness, etc., uh, the, the very preconditions of the exercise of any kind of autonomous individuality. But by the same token, he wants to say that uh, the very institutions that would make that condition, that exercise of freedom possible, are also the same conditions that, under present conditions, render it impossible. So we have a, a blatant contradiction, which, um, you know, there is no, uh, which has no, um, you know, positive synthetic upshot. Uh, there's, there's no way in which, uh, at least at first glance, this seems to point to some, um, you know, mediating solution. And this is how Adorno wants to distinguish, uh, his understanding of a negative dialectic from you know, what he calls the positive or sort of synthetic dialectic that uh, one gets in Hegel. And this isn't just, you know, some point of ontological difference, as if Adorno was saying that, you know, this is a met metaphysical truth about what dialectics is and that, you know, Hegel got this wrong. Um, what Adorno is saying is that there's been a profound transformation of historical conditions. and especially, you know, after the early teens in the 20th century and after what he saw as, um, you know, really the collapse of emancipatory politics, uh, this meant that, um, you know, the sort of optimistic assessment of dialectics as a kind of theoretical recognition of social contradictions with the potential to resolve themselves. Um, Adorno wants to say that that possibility of resolution, it, it dies with, you know, the collapse of emancipatory politics. So when Adorno formulates starting really, I mean, negative dialectics, uh, you know, comes out late in Adorno's career, but as he points out somewhere that, you know, basically since the, uh, late twenties, you know, he'd been thinking about, um, the idea of a negative dialectic, uh, or a dialectic that seems to just dissolve itself and have no, uh, resolution beyond itself. Um, what he's really trying to theorize is this changed set of historical circumstances and the changed meaning of social contradiction, which, you know, lost the sort of, um, potential emancipatory force that it had for for Marxists who were living through a genuine revolutionary moment. Mm -hmm. So Adorno was trying to codify theoretically in his late works um, the shifting meaning of the idea of dialectics, um, which is key to this very real transformation of, of society. Okay. Yeah, that's... Uh, um, that In that way... Adorno is historical, right? He he thinks that so, yeah. our understanding of what a dialectics, a dialectical approach to social change, for instance, might be, has to change uh, given historical developments and the, yeah. the, where we're situated in history. Specifically, 
we're no longer in a moment where there is an active political force uh, uh, w that is aiming at creating conditions of freedom. That's right. Right. And, and, um, and that force would be the movement for socialism. It would be the uh, struggle for workers' uh, emancipation, be, um, you know, the second international maybe. Yeah. Um, so does Adorno think that the failure of say the German revolution in uh, 1918 um, is the moment where we've experienced a historical change, which forecloses the possibility of continuing on with the kind of dialectical approach that Marx and Hegel uh, were championing and, and trying to, to bring into practice. Yeah, I think that that's, that that's right. And I mean, Adorno in his essay, those twenties, I mean, he also points to the year 1924 as sort of, uh, uh, in the context of, you know, modernism and an aesthetic context as, as sort of a, um, culminating point of catastrophe where this, you know, um, you know, this moment in which the possibility of, uh, you know, utopian transformation had seemed to crystallize was now really over and the artistic context and the theoretical context was beginning to catch up with that and was beginning to reflect that. Um, so Adorno's project basically, you know, from that point onward, uh, from the late twenties onward, um, is really a retrospective attempt to grapple with um, the sort of ripple effect from the failure of, you know, 1917, 1918. So um, there's a, uh, there's a Marxist, uh, uh, saying something that, you know, that humanity never challenges itself with a problem that it can't already overcome. Right. Um, but this, uh, idea of, of failure and maybe regression, I mean, you haven't said regression, but let's say yeah. that yeah. we've regressed after the failure of 1918, um, challenges that, that we're still, po we're still posing ourselves a problem that we no longer can overcome. And not only can we not overcome the problem, but we can't even fully take up or understand that's right. The yeah. problem. Yeah. Um, and it has to, and, and, and the art that we, uh, create, uh, after the failure of the, of the revolution, um, is an, an art where we start to see the failure of our imagination, of our aesthetic abilities, of our, ability to take up contradiction and 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 continue on in a dialectical way towards emancipation yeah right this would be the death of the avant-garde um, right. yeah right um so what art art does adorno point to uh the, as like exhibit a and uh you know in his uh judgment of the of, of the failure of the revolution and its consequences. Like what kind of art does Adorno think is representative of this failure of imagination, which is nobody's fault, but well, I mean, it's somebody's no. fault, it's, it's, but, but it's not the fault of the artists. No. Right. Um, so who does he, who is the example he would hold up? What, what kind of work um, does that? Yeah, there, there, there are a few, right. There are a few, you know, big names that one often hears associated with Adorno and the, the two biggest are probably, um, uh, Samuel Beckett and the others, um, Arnold Schoenberg and, uh, Adorno wrote, um, I believe philosophy of new music, uh, I think it came out in the forties. I can't quite remember the publication date. Um, he wrote a, he wrote one version of it actually in English. Um, and then he rewrote it in, uh, or he attempted to translate it into English and, uh, but it was eventually published in, in German. And that book was a comparative analysis of, um, Schoenberg and Stravinsky and sort of the way that the book is set up. Uh, I mean, it can seem a bit like hero and villain, where Schoenberg is the hero of this story and Stravinsky is the villain. Uh, and Adorno 
later criticized himself retrospectively for creating this impression. But the idea was supposed to be that, you know, uh, you know, Schoenberg had uh, in sort of his early work, um, you know, he'd innovated this 12 tone technique, which he was still incorporating uh, in the context of, you know, um, the more romantic music that he was making. And Adorno thought that, you know, to put it somewhat crudely, um, that, you know, uh, that Schoenberg was, was really doing two things. On the one hand, he was uh, further developing the musical material, as Adorno would put it, that Adorno, uh, that Schoenberg had um, uh, located in sort of, you know, the uh the principle of, of the master principle of harmony in music uh you know that, that Schoenberg had located you know the need for dissonance and you know this is what his early music had um uh, earlier music had sort of uh, uh unleashed and Adorno thought that um by making you know dissonance the sort of overriding principle of the compositions that um you know schoenberg had actually uh uh sort of pioneered this new form of um expressionism in music which was a form of sort of historical expressionism um that you know as adorno likes to use this metaphor that uh schoenberg's music was like a seismograph for historical change you know, through the sort of 12 tone technique that, that he invented serialism. Mm -hmm. The other side of the story is, you know, the uh, Stravinsky's neoclassicism and Stravinsky's belief that, um, you know, that the sort of foundational principles of, you know, music were in the past, uh, that one sort of had to return to, um, you know, these basic principles, uh, and Adorno saw this as a the same sort of tendency towards ontologization that, you know, he was criticizing in Heidegger and others at the time. So he's trying to show how both Schoenberg and Stravinsky are symptoms of their moment. And what on the one hand in Stravinsky or in Schoenberg, sorry, looks like musical progress, that he's doing something avant-garde. He's innovated this new technique that um, you know, seems to be demanded by musical form itself and seems to unlock a new potential in music. Uh, the sort of dialectic is that that very progress um, is sort of bought at the cost of social regression. And, you know, the very forces, social forces to which Schoenberg's music is giving expression, um, you know, they're both what make this, this, uh, new technique possible um but they're also you know there this is obviously for adorno it's a form of um political regression you know social collapse um and the the last thing i'll say about the schoenberg narrative is that you know later um thomas mann in his doctor dr faustus famously allegorizes uh you know, Schoenberg's um, innovation of the 12 tone technique and Adorno helped Mann write um, uh, many of the key um, musicological passages in this book. And what the allegory sort of shows is that uh, the protagonist of the novel, you know, it's a Faust narrative. He sells his soul to the devil um, in order to, uh, um, you know, um, in order to be able to pioneer the 12 tone technique. And this parallels in the novel, the rise of fascism. So, you know, and this is sort of a novelization of how Adorno saw this theoretically, that there's a deep, you know, intertwinement of musical progress, um, you know, political regression, and, uh, you know, the, uh, I mean, it's a version of what Dorno and Hokan were called the dialect of enlightenment um, because it's progress and regression together. Um, well, that's really very interesting. And um, I think I understand uh, 
I mean, I clearly understand what you're claiming, but I, I think I can even understand the logic behind it to a degree. But it would seem to me a more obvious move to claim that uh, Stravinsky was the artist that had, was uh, giving voice to a kind of regression by trying to hold on to the older forms um, and, and press on with a development which, which that was no longer possible. Whereas Schoenberg, by giving an expression to the dissonance, was actually addressing the historical moment. But in fact, because uh, Adorno is just is, is creating a negative dialectics, there is no positive side here. It's not, there's no. just two expressions of, of regression. Is that right? Yeah, except the, the differentiating factor is that... Um, I mean, maybe this is one way to put it, but that there is a sort of self-consciousness of regression in Schoenberg's music, whereas Stravinsky's music is simply performing and participating in the regression. Um, Schoenberg is able to, uh, you know, in a way, bring the regression um, to a kind of musical consciousness, and which is amenable to the sort of theorization that Adorno is providing. So that's why I think that Adorno, you know, for a time at least, I mean, he champions what, what Schoenberg is doing because um, even though they're both symptomatic, they're both symptomatic of regression. In Schoenberg, you do have um, a greater possibility for uh, historical self-consciousness. Okay. Um, but the fascists themselves would reject Schoenberg and okay. embrace Stravinsky. There's a, I remember there's a... Uh, uh, the Nazis put together a, a, an exhibit of modern art, uh, calling it degenerate art and putting all the cubists and avant-garde art, artists on display as, a, a, as, as symptomatic of a sickness, but not in the, in the way that Adorno would call them symptomatic. Yeah. Um, okay, so I have a question that I'm going to ask, even though I, I feel like it may not clarify much um, but to, to everybody, but it does to me, or at least it's something I'm really sincerely curious about, which sure. is, after like uh, i used to work at the oregon symphony for a while i uh had i was uh, friends with a composer a young man who was uh, trying to be become a composer um and uh he was interested in the atonal system of schoenberg but he didn't like it but he kind of was forced to sure. be interested in it through his education and then what he really embraced was the minimalism of like philip glass and uh, John Adams and and others, um, right. uh, and what he tried to do was create music that had a, co a, a co combination of of Schoenberg and, and Glass. Um, but what I, I always thought that the minimal. I really, by the way, I I really like Philip Glass. I could listen to him his music, yeah, right. and yeah. enjoy it. But I thought that probably from an Adorn from Adorno's perspective, the Glass would be more uh, of a, more regressive, or at least more un, uh, not self conscious, um, uh, because of its uh, tendency to want to return to uh, uh, harmony and and to to the most core kind of key components of the foundational components of of the Western tradition and hold those up in in kind of in the abstract or in, in right. isolation. Um, but but the other thing I noticed was that after minimalism, or maybe at the same time the minimalism arose, there really was no further development of musical schools of of sure. innovation. Yeah. Right. Um, that that minimalism became movie music and in the symphony orchestras, such as it is. There were some, you know, there was noise art, and there was like concrete uh, music and. And there were these little tiny exhibitions, you know, in the coastal cities. But for the most part, symphonic music just institutionalized and then into the nonprofits, nonprofit yeah, right. sector and um, just became a museum for the 19th century and, and earlier. Um, so uh, I guess the question I would have for you is that um, uh, do you agree with me about my estimation of what of minimalism and do you think that the failure to overcome or recognize, be self-conscious about the the end of history, 
that happened in 1918 uh, has deepened. Do you think that the what I just described is symptomatic of of, of that? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think that that's, yeah, I, I completely agree with that assessment. I mean, I think of the minimalists that Adams is perhaps the most interesting and there's the most potential there. I mean, not only because, you know, uh, he, his music is thinking about um, history in an unusual way, but also, um, you know, I guess potentially musically. And sometimes when Adorno wrote a essay, I think it was in the maybe the early 60s, um, called um, Toward a, an Informal Music. Mm-hmm. And he wrote this um, sort of when total serialism was, you know, had peaked and uh, you had this institutionalization of serialism. He liked the earlier Schoenberg, where Schoenberg was really combining. Um, you know, was was injecting the the twelve tone technique into a romantic style, um, precisely because he thought that it was a sharper dialectic. But when you know serialism was totalized and became you know institutional and you know a serialist piece, you know it was almost like a deductive operation. You could just deduce exactly what the piece would be like, and there was no real um, sort of art happening. Um, you know, Adorno started to criticize uh, the serialist movement. And, um, you know, for a while, there were a, a number of conservative music- musicologists, I think, in Germany who applauded Adorno for this because they thought that he'd finally come to their their side. Um, but it wasn't that. It wasn't out of some sense of traditionalism. It was rather because serialism itself had become traditionalist. And, you know, so Adorno started to criticize it. And as part of his response to this, he wrote this piece uh, towards an informal music, which um, was about what a possible uh, post-serialist music would look like um, in which, you know, uh, harmony was uh, sort of not, you know, dogmatically or militantly excluded, um, but that there was some possibility of a reproachment and it's 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 hard to say exactly what adorno had in mind and i I don't know that that there were any living um composers he thought embodied this idea uh but it's interesting that um he at least was projecting the possibility of a new music that you know wasn't the what had been new music namely serialism um so uh but yes I, I definitely agree with with your assessment of Glass in particular and Reich and um, and I think that you know uh, that that um, yeah that music itself I mean certainly hasn't escaped uh, you know the general forces of regression so right um, and again I should say that I I actually quite like Steve Reich and I I you know enjoy Philip Glass and I like John Adams as well um, but I find uh, John Adams is someone who I'll listen to more rarely than <laughs> sure. Philip Glass. Yeah. And and probably because I can turn on Philip Glass and do something else, right? It doesn't require much of me as John Adams right, does. Right. Um uh but uh so with um Adorno's theory of music as a symptom of the historical failure of, of the movement for socialism. I mean to say it so neatly it's probably not to do it justice, but nonetheless it, it's um the, there's this seems to me there's this still this notion that by developing a self-conscious uh, art form um, that it can help say the working class to come to recognition of its own historical conditions on a deep level not just you know like the way you would if you read a pamphlet but by thinking through with music and having an aesthetic experience yeah. of of this um, the, and that that somehow could help uh the working class and and the people of the world um redevelop the uh, overcome the regression am i is that is that right am, is that too close to the negation of the negation um is that too positive of spin on what adorno was doing i think that maybe what he's doing is a step prior in that 
you know, Adorno wants to make available, or he thinks that, you know, the kind of art that Beckett or Schoenberg is creating, um, before we can get to the point where, you know, uh, there could be something like a, a genuinely revolutionary art or an art capable of inducing that sort of um, historical consciousness of capital, I think that, you know, Adorno thinks that the task has become more primitive in a way, precisely because we've regressed so far. And that's to say that, you know, um, at this point, we're just trying to keep alive the bare memory, uh, you know, of, of the problem, the bare memory that, that there was a sort of emancipatory, you know, moment historically, um, and that there was this sort of, uh, historical opportunity, which is, you know, seemingly past. Um, so in a way, I mean, uh, you know, as, as Adorno thought that his own project, as he characterized it, um, was a sort of message in a bottle for later generations. Um, you know, I, I think that Adornian thought is philosophy and survivalist mode in a way. It's just trying to keep alive sort of the bare memory of the possibility of something like social critique, um, because the kind of productive critique that you know, it was obviously possible for, for Marx and, you know, for Luxembourg and for Lenin and even to some degree still for, uh, Lukash, um, you know, that that's no longer possible. So that means that theory is sort of, um, and art, uh, are, are both, um, operating at a further remove and a sort of second level abstraction. Um, and I think that's sort of the, and Adorno talks a lot about this, you know, about the abstractness of modern art, about the abstractness of, of, uh, you know, mid 20th century modernism, that Beckett's art is, you know, black and it's abstract. Um, and it has to do with this, this tendency that, uh, you know, um, there are no concrete possibilities to which we can point that, that, uh, we can theorize in terms of, you know, sort of a possibility for, political organization for change. Um, so rather we have to theorize the memory of such possibilities. Um, and that's both the task of art and theory for Adorno. Now, um, when I was in my twenties, I discovered and decided I quite liked Beckett, you know, as well. Uh, uh, I, I kind of conceived of him as being aligned with existentialism. Um, and maybe pessimism, but, but existentialism, I'm not sure if that's correct. You know, this is back when I was much younger sure. and, 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 uh, learning this stuff on my own. Um, but, uh, the works that come to mind uh, for me first are like craps last tape, last tape. And then, um, uh, uh, the other one that, you know, everyone knows is waiting for Godot. Um, and both of those works are about, well, certainly craps last tape, tape, not last take. Maybe I'm so immersed in internet culture. I have to say take, like hot take, <laughs> craps last hot take. Uh, um, but his last tape um, was about a man who had missed an opportunity to, to have a, a life of uh, meaning and, and uh, to develop himself and be free in a way. You know, it takes the form of a, a lost love, uh, but... Um, uh, it, it certainly, um, seems to align with this vision of Adorno's, of, of the loss of, of historical possibility. Um, did Adorno have a relationship with Beckett and what was his view of Beckett's work? Uh, yeah, they, they, um, so Adorno was actually going to dedicate aesthetic theory to Beckett, um, but died before he could do so. So aesthetic theory is Adorno's laughs sort of and it's an unfinished work um what we have are fragments uh, but he also knew beckett they met um they met uh in germany i believe when there was a production of endgame and, and beckett was invited to the premiere and i think that they also met in paris uh i think in the 50s um 
but um, Beckett did not really love Adorno personally. Um, he there's a famous uh, sort of you know anecdote where uh, during one of their meetings, um, Adorno was insisting that the character Ham in Endgame was an abbreviation of Hamlet. It was a reference to Hamlet, and um, and Beckett said that that was wrong. Um, but Adorno was very insistent, and anyway. And then later that evening, Adorno gave his talk, which later became the essay "Trying to Understand Endgame." Uh, Adorno's very famous essay on Beckett, and he, you know, he gives this this interpretation of the Ham character. And, Beckett is said to have whispered to someone in the audience, you know, something like, you know, that uh, this is what, you know, academics are. You know, they just say whatever they want. Uh, and so that was his, you know, uh, impression of um, of Adorno, I think. But I think they also did have a, a kind of friendship, but um, maybe the it was more one-sided. Um, but on to the, the substance, I think that... Uh, Yeah, that there's probably no other artist, author, etc., whom Adorno admired more, and whose work Adorno thought was more um, uh, sort of expressive and um, uh, you know appropriate to the historical moment. And you know, I think that this um, there's a number of complex reasons for this, um, but in particular. Uh, I mean, to, to go back to your point about existentialism, um, I think one thing that Adorno was really trying to do was, in that essay in particular, was to point out that, you know, um, superficially, you know, Beckett is, it looks like he's concerned with the burden of freedom and, you know, the sort of... Uh, isolation of the modern individual and alienation and these sort of Sartrean and maybe even Heideggerian themes. Um, but Adorno, you know, sort of takes great pains in this essay to show that, um, you know, as, as he says, uh, at one point in the essay, he says something to the effect that, um, you know, philosophy in Beckett's work is just treated as cultural detritus that, you know, for Beckett, um, the so-called, you know, fundamental existential state of man or existential despair, um, you know, that, that these are, uh, sort of parodies of our actual, the actual horror of our condition, which is historical, uh, in nature. So what Adorno thought that, that Beckett was really doing was, um, you know, rather than sort of, giving ontological insight into the human condition or something like that, that, um, that, you know, Beckett was more so than anyone else showing that, um, you know, meaning itself, meaning in art, social meaning, um, we're really at the point of absolute collapse, you know, that with the failure once again of socialism, the collapse of emancipatory politics, that Beckett is sort of the, uh, hyperbolic, you know, vision of what this entails, that the sort of apocalyptic scenario that you have in Beckett, this is the kind of, um, you know, it's a way of, of modeling artistically or literarily, um, you know, what we've done to ourselves. Uh, so I think that for, you know, Adorno was also going to, um, uh, he planned a, a big essay on Beckett's trilogy of novels um, published in the late 40s and early 50s, first in French and then in, in English, um, Malloy, Malone Dies, and The Unnameable. And uh, just a few years ago, Adorno's notes on The Unnameable were finally um, uh, published and translated into English. And, you know, this was sort of, he thought that The Unnameable was the greatest work of modernist art and that this final novel in Beckett's trilogy, um, you know, was sort of the, uh, the culmination of late modernism and, um, you know, really, uh, was the best expression that we have of, uh, this 
late capitalist, post-proletariat, you know, post-socialist um, condition. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, what really uh, stuck out in what you just said to me was the claim that Adorno made about Beckett in terms of his uh, relationship to or understanding of philosophy. Um, uh, philosophy is just more uh, cultural kibble, you know, as not um, not uh, a kind of sacred discourse of wisdom where we can arrive at a true understanding, universal understanding, transhistorical understanding, but rather it's just another way in which we express our immediate historical concerns. Yeah. Um, and I was reminded of, uh, again, uh, you know, I, I'm, I, this is just, when you hit 51, you, I guess you're just nostalgic all the time. When I was in my twenties, I was just starting out as a novelist and I knew a guy who was also writing short stories and, and, uh, he told me, cause I was studying philosophy at the same time. And he said, listen, kid, philosophers are just want to be novelists. I can't do it. That's all they are. <laughs> you know, the, right. it, there's nothing there for you that's better than what, what you're trying to do here. Um, and, uh, I thought that was cynical and, you know, yeah. egotistical and, but perhaps he would agree with Adorno, uh, or, you know, or with Beckett, uh, at, at least. Um, which means that, uh, you know, that, yeah, that is a, a different approach to theory that we, we no longer stand in position to reality such that we can uh, be self-conscious enough to determine what our secondary characteristics from primary characteristics, like what is just our cultural uh, creation and what is uh, actually out there in the world beyond us. And, yeah. you know, what, what kind of arguments are making claims that are not self-interested. Um, so, uh, now, I, I feel as though, and my initial question about the, the Kantian left has let, been left behind. I, I'm not sure to, to the degree to which uh, someone like Zizek would disagree with these interpretations, although I'm not sure if I could get him to arrive at anything that would uh, be clear enough for me to know, right? <laughs> but, but, and if there's a, a philosopher who might might ex exemplify this uh, uh, tendency for the work of philosophy to become just another cultural uh, entertainment. It might be Zizek, although I, I would claim that's actually the fact that people say that about him is to, you know, a compliment to him. Sure. But um, uh, what I want to do is try to uh, get to a political, philo philosophical conversation away from art now for a bit. But we're at 45 minutes. And I, I, what I'm thinking we might do is continue on if you have time. Yeah, uh, yeah, for a bit longer. Uh, but but from this point on, it will be for people who are paying a little extra to get access to the Patreon, and and they'll see the they'll see the you know more abstract conversation if we can manage to have 